I'll do it. Thank you. I'll start again. Had this uh, festival taken place a fortnight ago, I think the discussion that we're about to have would have been very different, but the news coverage around the bombings at the Boston Marathon have once again highlighted the complexity of making sense of a rapidly moving landscape where facts, rumours, conversations on the police scanner and sometimes contradictory eyewitness accounts all compete for our attention. Some news organisations covering the Boston bombings try to be as fast as Twitter and by doing so they ended up with egg on their faces. The sheer tidal wave of information that now accompanies any news story means that Twitter's greatest strength, its speed and the direct access it gives us as journalists to a vast number of news sources can also be its biggest weakness. So over the next 85 minutes or so, I want to examine with our panel what lessons we can learn from the coverage of the Boston bombings and then move on uh, to ask what are our responsibilities towards the eyewitnesses who increasingly are becoming our reporters. I'm going to talk with the panel for about 45 minutes and then open up to questions on the floor. Just to briefly introduce our panel, Turi Munthi, founder and former CEO of Demotics, Mark Little, founder of the social media agency uh, Storyful, Anthony DeRosa, social media uh, editor at Reuters, Adam Baker, founder of Blotter, and Eric Carvin, social media editor at the Associated Press. Eric, I want to start uh, with you, if I may, with a question that uh, was put by, or a statement that was put by AP's executive editor, Kathleen Carroll. Uh, she sent out an email after the Boston coverage and said, we're going to make mistakes. Our everlasting job is to make sure we make fewer of them and we don't keep making the same ones over and over again. And when something is wrong, we're clear about saying so, which is something we didn't do well last week. So what lessons do you think AP has learned from the coverage of the, of the Boston bombing? Well, I think, uh, I think that was a, a specific situation where we, did, we, we, had a, we had a little bit of a misstep that I don't think is something that we do all of the time. We weren't as clear as we could have been in correcting something. Um, and, uh, and we needed to make sure, and, and I think maybe that has, I don't know if that has something to do with the pressure of, of, of a story as important as it was and as fast moving as it was. Um, but, I mean, the fact is it was, it was a specific thing that, that happened in the middle of a big story that I think we handled pretty well for the most part, um, and, including you know, on the accuracy front. Um, there were, uh, you know, there were, some, there were some things that ended up being wrong that we got from sources that we thought we could rely upon which unfortunately is something that happens in a major news story from time to time, and there may have been some little micro lessons learned on the, on the local kind of in the field level from that, but I think we handled things pretty well for the most part. I, I, I don't think, I mean, you know, transparency is key here, obviously. Whenever you make mistakes, and this is something that frankly I think uh, is nothing new about this. This isn't really part of the digital world or the social world, is, you know, acknowledging your mistakes and, and, and coming up front, being up front with them. I think honestly, um, there's in some way more of an imperative to do it well and to do it uh, more loudly than in the past. I think, you know, newspapers used to have very small print corrections, and they still do, frankly. Um, that would, that would may come out three or four days after a story ran, and that might not be seen by a lot of people. Now that everything is happening digitally, you need to be really upfront with it. You need to be public about it uh, and uh, sort of say what we got wrong and how we got it wrong and then just simply be prepared to move on to the next thing and internally learn from, learn from the mistakes. You know, I, I, I think that, I think that there were, I, I think that we still did, for the most part, we, we, our, our reporting worked, our, our reporting mechanisms worked well, and we had very experienced journalists involved with the story, um, including on the digital front. And uh, I think we managed to avoid certain slip-ups and we were, pretty circumspect about what we were going we to put out in the first place. And to the point that we might have been a little slower on some points than some others, but we were perfectly satisfied with that because of the results. I will come back to that question of speed and whether it, there is a case where being slower is better, because I think that's a very important issue. But uh, turning to your opposite number at Reuters, Anthony, apart from a, a very public spat with a now former Reuters colleague over the Boston bombings, what do you think Reuters learned from from the Boston bombings coverage? Well, I didn't just learn this through Boston, but I feel like I've learned this over uh, the last couple of years that I've moved, shifted from being a technologist to uh, someone who works in editorial is that speed is not the most important thing, at least in what I believe that I'm doing. It's accuracy and uh, slowing down and making sure that you're double and triple checking uh, what you're seeing. Uh, and I think 
Jeff Jarvis uh, did an excellent job at distilling what we should be doing more of is telling people what we don't know right now. And he, if you look up Jeff's uh, blog, uh, you'll find this post that he wrote called, Here's What We Don't Know. And I think we need to do more of that. I think we need to be more transparent, put out more about uh, the reports that are already out there and giving more clarification to them, whether you're reporting them or someone else is reporting them, explaining a bit more about where that information's coming from and um, what it's rooted in. And um, I, I, I think you're, you need to absorb more information than you're putting back out. And there's tons and tons of streams coming from citizen journalists, coming from other news outlets, um, and I think what we need to do is continue to absorb that information, take it in, listen to it, read it, um, but then go off and do our own double checking verification. Um, and then when we disseminate that ourselves, put in a lot more information. And I don't think we can do this over Twitter, unfortunately. Uh, I feel like I'm doing less reporting via Twitter and sending people to a place where I have a little bit more room to put more context and put more information about what I'm seeing. So I actually feel like I'm going to be doing less reporting via Twitter, but I'm going to use Twitter as a signal or as an entry point to pull you to somewhere else where I can give you more information and explain things to you better. Mark, I want to uh, ask you to answer the question you, you raised on a blog post that you published on Sunday, uh, which had the title, When Everyone is an Eyewitness, What is a Journalist? So I think what Boston proved to me was, you know, and we've been saying it for a couple of years, I mean, we're at a revolutionary moment in journalism, there's no question, you know, in the same way when the telephone and tech television came along, you know, ch technology has changed the way we behave. <clears throat> and when I put that question about Boston, what I was trying to do was also draw attention to a clash of cultures that were also is hampering our ability to integrate this technology. And that's between an old model of breaking news in which we own stories, we break stories. There was no better... Uh, thing for a journalist uh, than to own a story. We always said it about each other. You can't own a story in, in, when you have the most authentic account of that story is, is without, you know, it doesn't pass through you anymore. Uh, in the old days, we owned the transmitters with the printing presses as journalists. We owned everything about the news business and you, the audience, were passive. You consumed. It's all changed. So what is a journalist? A journalist now is a manager of an overabundance of information. You have 72 hours of video uploaded on YouTube every single minute. Now, in that, there is a tiny, tiny proportion of video that is game-changing. So, for example, last week in Boston, we had a woman approaching the finish line of the Boston Marathon with a GoPro camera on her head. And she captured the moment the bomb exploded. Now, as a journalist who's covered war and has covered conflict, I've never seen a more authentic vision of stories emerging than this one. Uh, two weeks before, in Syria, we got a video of a journalist embedded with the Syrian army. He had a GoPro camera on a tank. He recorded the moment the tank beside him was blown up. We then got video from the Syrian rebels who fired the missile that blew up that tank. We could see that war from two sides in real time. So what is a journalist? A journalist is someone who takes this content, these individual data points, and turns them into stories. And context, the word that Anthony used, uh, is, is where the value is in journalism these days, not in speed, certainly not in any competitive battle with your other uh, news agency or your newspaper, because we're all now in a battle with the authenticity of the internet, and we're there to give the context that makes this useful to the world. That's what a journalist is. I'm glad you mentioned that uh, issue of authenticity, because it's one that, that Adam is very key to what Blotter does. Uh, reading from your mission statement, you say, we believe the best news stories come from people at the scene able to capture and report on stories as they unfold. But are there cases in, in, in which the people on the scene aren't the best place to report on what's happening because they only have a partial picture of, from their own viewpoint? No, I don't, I don't think so. Um, I think they've got a, they've got a view. Um, and we, you know, they're there, they're witnessing it. Um, I, I firmly believe that people at the scene of an event are best placed to report what they witness. It's up to us what we do with that content. Um, and I think you're, what, what's great about citizen journalism or whatever, whatever you want to, however you want to phrase it, is that you, you do get not only an unbiased report of what's going on, but you can get it from all angles. So you'll, you'll get news and you'll get footage and coverage from lots of different people at the scene of the same event um, and over the full cycle of the event. So, um, you know, we, we see footage 
uh, emerge over, the, over the, the, an hour or two of an event um, that, that actually builds the picture for us. When we initially get an image or a video through, we actually, we're, sometimes we're not sure what's going on here. Uh, and it's only over, the, over sort of a 10 or 15 minute period where we get more footage from it um, that we can then start to build that picture. But I think that it's up to us and it's up to journalists to decide what they do with that, that, that footage. Um, I, I think citizen journalism and technology has game changed the ability to, um, to break news and, and to cover stories. And I think it really helps journalists. I think, you know, there, there was, a lot, there was a, a lot of talk about how citizen journalists could put journalists out of work and, and how it's disruptive to traditional journalism. And I absolutely disagree with that. I think it's powerful and I think it, it, it complements traditional journalism um, perfectly well. Sorry. Um some people wanted to blame Twitter for some of the mistakes of the Boston coverage, which seems a ridiculous thing to do. Twitter is, after all, just a platform. It's, it's, it's what you do with it that, that matters. Um, were some of the mistakes that were made over the coverage of Boston not Twitter's problem, but the fact that people using Twitter didn't use it very well? There's been... Um I think there's been a real shift in the way that people understand Twitter. So if you... There's, I mean, and, and there's a history to its to its use for journalism. If you remember um, in June 2009 when Iran's otherwise very healthy relationship with democracy suffered a little blip um, and um, the elections were stolen by Ahmadinejad, the world exploded on Twitter. There were a billion tweets in a matter of a couple of weeks, I think, which back in the day was an enormous amount. Um, coming from, I think, 0.002% of the population who had a Twitter account. Um, and so that, we told the story wrong on the back of that. We absolutely did. What we were basically witnessing was a you know, spontaneous uh, uprising and protest, outrage, against what had happened, but from a very particular segment of uh, Iranian society, which we misrepresented. Two years later, and Tahrir Square, suddenly about 20% of the Egyptian population of, uh, under a certain age who were engaged in this kind of space are on Twitter. The picture that you end up building, as Adam says, the picture that you end up building is more nuanced because there's f far more voices on it. It's still not good enough. Turns out that most of us were able to listen to the English-speaking voices on, in, in Egypt, not the Arab-speaking voices. And they were telling a different story themselves. Also, the people who ended up winning the, um, the, uh, the revolution in, in Egypt, if you can call it that, uh, was the Muslim Brotherhood, who predominantly were not involved in social media in that space. So we couldn't hear that either. As Twitter, uh, and I uh, it's sort of my fundamental tool for news now, as it is for a lot of people, I think, as Twitter grows and grows up and moves out of its child and adolescent phase in this space, and you get bigger demographics working with it across not just language, not just class, but also entire countries, um, it becomes a much more useful, a much more useful tool, and it has grown up. Is that something you're aware of? That the story tell us that, that, that you work with on Blotter. Uh, uh, from a certain demographic? Is that demographic shifting? Mm, oh, so. the, 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 the majority of people that contribute to us are caught up in conflict. Um, and so they just witness, they, they're sending reports in on what they witness. Um, we've actually shifted our focus from away from being a, a destination site and trying to, trying to package up the, the, the footage we receive into some kind of journalistic long form piece into actually providing it to news organisations and, and letting them um, package it up. Uh, and, and we find now that you know, our, our main focus is making sure we can verify the source. Um, and, and normally, that, this, that, that source is, is caught up in conflict or is circumstantially at the scene of an event. Let's talk about verification very briefly. Uh, maybe, Mark, you want to pick up on that? Ver verification, that Adam just mentioned, absolutely key to what Storyful does and what, what we do as journalists, what we've always done as journalists. Yeah, and it, this is very important to say right now that we're not talking about some new form of journalism. I mean, this is the old eternal values of journalism just applied to a new platform, a new technology. Um, but I do think what's happened for us, um, and I think for everybody who's verifying now, because I think <clears throat> there's no secret sauce here. You know, you don't do it by technology. It's a human activity. But we can scale it. So when you look at the whole open source tools out there that we can use from, you know, uh, Wolfram Alpha or from Google Maps, Google Earth, there's a stunning array of tools out there, which I'd love to see the news business think about pulling together so we can actually scale verification. And that's the problem right now. I mean, you've got to employ a lot of people, spend a lot of money to do this kind of thing. Um, you know, that video I mentioned earlier on of the GoPro uh, at Boston uh, bombing, I mean, that took four hours to, first of all, go find out if, the, if this was actually a runner 
and what was her name and was she on the list of runners and where would she have been at that point in time and what's her name and is she on Facebook and there's her mother and we've got her mother, we've talked to the mother, we'll talk to her and she talks to us and suddenly now we've got the whole picture. That took three hours. Now that's not cheap. So I think what we should be doing is putting a lot more effort in collectively, collaboratively uh, between us, uh, news organizations, existing ones, new organizations like Blotter, like Storyful, and coming up with a way that we can actually collaborate in real time in a way that benefits the public. Because as I say, if it's not going to be about competing for speed, well, let's collaborate for accuracy. And I think that's what I would be putting out today as my big message. On the accuracy issue, I, I was personally quite shocked by a, a question that was raised in the Washington Post, the fact that it even had to be raised at all. So I'm going to throw this open to whoever wants to answer it. Um, the mistake, uh, there was a, a quote in the Washington Post in an article that said, mistakes happen often in uh, reporting big, complicated, fast-moving stories like the one in Boston. The question is, how much does errone erroneous reporting matter these days? Um, there is a well-known phrase in British newsrooms, never wrong for long. Um, <laughs> is that good enough? Well, I... I don't think that's good enough at all. I, I, I think that one um, unfortunate side effect of the, of the sort of social news world is that there has been in some circles a little bit more of a tolerance for inaccuracy for a period of time and that there are some people who feel like, well, you know, doing something quickly and then correcting it quickly, you end up in the right place in the end. That's what matters. It's all real time. Um, but I, I, I still find that troubling. I mean, our, I think the American version of that is get it first, but first get it right. Um, something you hear around AP a lot. And um, to me, this is, a, this is a big part of the role of the professional journalist in, uh, in a world of citizen journalism. Uh, and this is why we, I don't think we are going away, because um, we have this, uh, you know, in theory at least, we have a level ex of experience um, verifying information that has nothing to do with where it might have come from. It's just what we do as journalists. And um, my view of it is, and I think that uh, another issue that comes up is I think that people treat different platforms differently when it comes to accuracy. Uh, there are some who feel more, comf more comfortable putting something out on Twitter that they, or poss possibly in a blog that they might not feel comfortable putting out in a traditional story um, that would go out to the cust their customers in a more traditional way. We treat all of our platforms the same way, and we, and we don't do that uh, where, where we are. Um, but uh, so that means sacrificing speed in some cases, uh, which is fine. And, but that also means, uh, as we were saying before, sort of accepting when we are wrong. Um, but one important point related to accuracy, so we, we've talked about this, a few people have, uh, have referenced this notion of, so um, when you get information from citizen journalists, there's a sense of it being an unfiltered, direct, uh, from where news is happening, you can rely on it being uh, that you uh, maybe rely is too strong a world word, but it comes across as being unbiased. It's simply you're seeing the video, you're watching, seeing the photos. Um, but the fact is, it's it's not really unbiased very often. It's not reliable a lot of the time. We do need professionals. Uh, first of all, very often, um, very often, user-generated content is distributed and described as something that it's not. Um, the example that I like to give is uh, there was a piece of video we were looking at from Syria from the early days of the, of the conflict there that appeared to be, a, uh, what in fact was, a gun battle in the streets of Dara. Um, and it was really vivid stuff, really good video, and ended up being used in various, um, uh, in various platforms by other news organizations. And it said that it was just said it was describing the current day's fighting in, in Dara. And um, we ran it past our, our people in the field who looked at it. And one of our, it was our, one of our correspondents in Beirut, which is where our Syria coverage was based because we couldn't physically be in Syria at the time. And he said, oh, well, this is, there's nothing inaccurate about this, but it's two weeks old at least. We said, well, how do you know that? And he said, well, there's a statue of Assad in the background that was knocked down, and nobody ever put it back up. So this is the bottom line to me, and an important, uh, in, the important role of the professional journalist in this process is that when it comes to verification and accuracy, yes, we're looking for more tools, and there hopefully will be ways that, we, that those can help us with that process, but we need to pick up the phone, sometimes you know, put on your shoes and go outside and be a reporter in order to see the stuff is, is, is actually right. Another example of that was from the US elections when uh, there was a video floating around, floating around on YouTube early on, I'm sure a lot of people in this room may have seen, um, that showed an electronic voting machine where somebody was pressing Obama, but Romney's name kept lighting up, 
And I saw that and my initial instinct was, well, there's no way that this is real. Somebody made this up as a joke or to make a point of some kind. Turns out it actually was. Um, but the way that we, ver we confirmed that is by talking to election officials in Pennsylvania who said they had a malfunctioning machine. Um, and you know, it was our sources there that allow allowed us to figure that out. So um, good sourcing and the ability to have just sort of strong old-fashioned journalistic instincts are what turn citizen journalism into journalism. And so that, I think, is a very important uh, thing to keep in mind. Uh, never wrong for long, good enough. Anybody else want to pick up on that? I, I agree with Eric. I think there needs to be more collaboration between people who are digital natives with people who are old school journalists because everything we do in this social news reporting world has to be rooted in all the things that we've learned from journalism from hundreds of years ago, everything that we know about going out and verifying things, talking to people who are in the field like Eric mentioned. I mean, that's where you're going to find uh, the truth through all the noise that we're seeing through through uh, social reports, things that are coming in through citizen uh, journalists. Um, and Mark's agency does a great job at this because they've, they've over time, they've accumulated sources. Uh, they know the citizen journalists that are often producing a lot of this information. They know the ones they can trust. They know the ones that they need to be a little bit wary of. Um, and if newsrooms become better integrated um, and collaborate more with the people who are looking at all this content, the social content that is now becoming the stuff that goes on the nightly news, that goes on the front page of all the newspapers. Um, if, if, if they continue to not pay attention to all, all these things that are popping up on social, two things are happening. A, they're not reporting accurately and, and properly all the things that are going on in the world because it's, it's, it's being transmitted through social before it is anywhere else. And two, we're missing a huge opportunity to do a better job at informing everyone by taking all, that, uh, all, the, all, the, all the things that we've learned for so many years about how to properly vet and verify information. And, um, and I, 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 unfortunately, I feel like this is very much a uh, generational issue, that the folks who have worked in newsrooms for 30 plus years are still somewhat not ready to accept what's going on in the social world. And the people in the social world have the same problem because they look at the people who worked in the newsrooms for 30 plus years and they basically look at them as the old guard and they don't want to work together with them. But that really has to change. Both generations have to really start to work together more and collaborate and learn from each other. And that very much goes to the heart of what Mark, you said in your blog post that people who call themselves, in inverted commas, true journalists haven't yet come up with a coherent response to the changing news environment they find themselves in. Yeah, and I think part of the reason for that is that at the moment there's kind of no financial incentive. <clears throat> and it just kind of sounds strange, um, a very high-minded panel, to talk about business models. What we need to be doing is saying there's enough value and more value actually in calling bullshit on a story as there is in trying to report something quick. And in the old days with breaking news, the, the failed model of breaking news, you had 24-hour coverage to sustain. One of the biggest problems about being a journalist in the field, particularly in a war zone, was you were locked to an earpiece and a camera because you were needed 24 hours a day. You didn't get to do original reporting. So I think now it's really important that we create financial incentives for news organizations, but also for citizens to actually be calling bullshit, to be pointing out when things are wrong. And to that end, I just would make a point where, you know, I don't know if anyone else in the room feels this way, but I think citizen journalism is a horrible phrase. I think completely out, mis, misplaced in many ways. Because citizen journalism is actually two different things. On the one hand, what I call the pro-ams are the motivated activists, uh, the people who just love local politics and will sit at a council meeting and report via Twitter, uh, the people that might be freelance journalists who have been laid off by news organizations who want to come and work with Blotter or Demotics or whoever. And then there's the group of accidental witnesses, the people who you know, commit random acts of journalism just because they happen to be somewhere at the right time and may only once in their life be a citizen journalist. Those people, and I think Stuart, you made a very important point in your introduction saying we have a responsibility to those people. It's not just about what they can do for us. We have to provide ways that they can see value, whether that's money or credit, goes back to them and that we protect them. And that's Storyful's big sort of mission this year is uh, verification clearly is what we do, but this year is to create an ethical business model for user content. And I think that is going to be an absolute priority because that's the only way this is ever going to change is if 
people are making some money out of it somewhere. And I would think that's the point I would make. And we will come back to that in the second part of the discussion. Uh, Suri, you wanted to, to pick up. Yeah, I, I, I just want to reinforce something that both, both Anthony and Mark just, just said. I think that the argument as to whether citizen journalism is going to replace professional journalism or, um, uh, or citizen journalism the thing is its own, it's done. We know the way this is going to work, and it's going to work like this forever. You have professional journalists pro creating professional news, and they have an army of, and the word that you keep on using but we haven't flagged, is sources. And what, this whole new world of content that is being shipped out there is simply sources. So, Eric, when you're seeing that stuff coming in, you're treating it as a source. You have to verify it. It's, it's complicated, and it was conceptually difficult for people to deal with because it was also a piece of documentary evidence. So it was also, it was also, it was also publishable. It's also out published publicly in many cases. Your right. sources are, are very public things, and that, that's something that makes some journalists a little uncomfortable, and you have to come up with new ways to approach that. So I think that let's, let's scotch this conversation. We know that the model is collaborative. It's extremely good. It's done amazing things for journalism, and it's only going to get better. The key thing, I think, is what Mark's just flagged, which is responsibility towards uh, those people now engaged in this news cycle. And there, there are the witnesses, the, the very occasional committers of random acts of journalism, nice phrasing. Um, there are freelancers in their various guises where I think, and, and as we all know, freelance, freelance reporters, and this is where I would really like to drive this conversation from my perspective with you guys, is freelancers are uh, ever more c present in the, um, in, in the news ecology. Um, we saw it across the Arab so-called spring, um, they continue to go into places where staff journalists who have seen their numbers cut back um, can't get to. Um, and we have a massive, as media organizations, um, whether we are uh, people like Demotics or Blotter who are financially, and I, you know, me, I'm Maxi, me culpa here, we financially incentivize people to get, put themselves in the way of all sorts of things to report on the news. Do we have a sensible protection mechanism for them when everything goes wrong? No. Big news organizations also. BBC, AP Reuters use freelancers and they also subsequently use a non-commissioned um, citizen journalists or freelancers work. Again, do we have the right support structures in place? I think the answer is categorically not. So one, how do we deal with these new contributors and this growing army of contributors into the news cycle in a way which is ethical? And two, how can we also, and this is a separate question, remind ourselves that what you see isn't always the only truth. And I'm, I'm, I'm concerned, and I've worked at a photojournalism organization for the last five years, that actually the news that I see, the demise of investigative journalism, the demise of long form, may be in a way culturally linked to this growing sense that if you, we're used to seeing things to be able to validate them ourselves. Perhaps when we don't see them, when it's long form, when it's complicated, when it's deep reporting, maybe we trust it less. I wonder whether there's a conversation to be had about the culture of news storytelling. Do you want to pick up, Adam, on, on, on uh, what Tori's just said? What duty of care do you have at Blotter for the people who are providing your content? Sure. Um, so the answer to that is, you know, we, w we would never ask somebody to go out and find content for us. We, we, we wouldn't assign a, a, anything to some, a, anyone on our network and say, look, we, you know, we, we're aware that there's something going on in, you know, in Damascus and we really want footage from this. We wouldn't do that because at that point, um, you know, there is a potential that we're putting people at risk. Um, so what we do is we rely on people sending us content in. And so the news agenda is very, for us, is, or what we, what we actually, the footage we get is very much reliant on what our network is able to, to, uh, to un un uncover. I think that's ducking the issue, unfortunately. I think that by creating a financial incentive for people to ship um, mm -hmm. news stories through your platform, you are actually asking them to do it. Or well, you're, in a sense, contributing it's to it's their It's an interesting one, too, so. because uh, we, so we trialed last year, or 18 months ago now, we trialed paying people, right, because we actually thought that we would get more content and better content and more exclusive content. Uh, and, and not many people took it up because we found that in our, we, we have a network now of around 300,000 people around the world um, that we know and we trust and have posted for us before and we've been able to verify. Um, and we, we tried to find a way of, of, of making it sustainable for them. Um, and hardly any, I mean, like literally, it was like 3% of, our, of our, um, our network at the time, which was around about 130,000, um, took us up on the offer. Because most people that in our network were doing so because they, they wanted to expose the, the, the news or the, the kind of the conflict they were caught up in. They wanted people to know what was going on in the world. It was self-gratification. They wanted to be credited for it, um, almost always anonymously, so they would have some kind of pseudo-name. Um, 
but they didn't actually want paying for it. Now what we're doing, uh, and to be fair, at the time, we actually weren't getting paid for our journalism. We're, we were making our money on adverts, and we weren't making very much of that. Um, we've now changed our strategy where we, we aren't, aren't really interested at all in, in, in broadcasting that news ourselves. We work with news organizations now um, to provide them with all of the content and the verification um, processes that we have to enable their newsrooms to, to, to produce better journalism. Um, and they pay us. So we are now kicking that back on. So every time a piece of our video or, or an image is used, we pay the contributor. Whether they like it or not, we, pay, we, you know, we find a way of paying them. Um, if they don't give us any bank details or, or a PayPal account, which is typically how we, um, we pay people, um, then we can't. But typically, we, you know, we really want to pay in people. in terms of cash. I actually mean in terms of support. Mm -hmm. So we had a case, um, an absolute ter terrible case, about th three months ago. One of our reporters on Demotics was killed in Syria. Um, he reported... He, he put his, a lot of his work through Demotics. He also shipped into the AFP. I called up the AFP. I'm naming them here. Um, I called up the AFP and said, we're going to try and find cash to give so that we can help bring his natural birth mother over from, uh, from the US to his funeral in France. Um, and we did. We have a relationship with a freelance uh, organization called the Rory Peck Trust, which is a totally, in, it, it, it's, this is inefficient, this is not um, scalable, this is all sorts of things which are wrong with it, but we nevertheless do have that relationship. I called up the AFP and said, are you guys going to do anything? And the question there was, well, maybe we'll try and do a little collection around the office. That's not the correct response. But it, it, sorry, it's very difficult, though. It, I mean, you know, a lot of, a lot it of may our... be very difficult. I'm saying it is very difficult. What, I'm, what I think we should be trying to talk about is how we can yeah, potentially we, yeah, build something yeah, which does totally provide agree. that support. But I think it's, it's a very difficult path because you know a lot of our, our um, a lot of our, our sources, whilst we, we trust them because we know who they are, we actually don't know who they are. If that makes sense, right? Yeah. They're, they're anonymous to us. So how do you yeah. help these guys? So the way that we help them, or we try to kind of. Not put them, we don't put them into any danger if we can help it. They're just at the scene, um, either, um, Mark's absolutely right, they are activists um, or yeah. they've got, they've got a, a, an agenda, this is the, they want to report news for a certain reason, or they're just circumstantially at the event. Um, the best rule in the world for us is that you know, we don't ask people to do any more than they're al already offering us. Um, but we'd love to find a, a way of supporting them if we could. Well, let's bring in the, the uh, two guys from the big boys, from uh, AP and Reuters. Uh, I was interested, uh, one of the things I notice when I get my daily advisory in my inbox from Reuters about the stories that are coming up tomorrow is Reuters' Syria social media cover. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that your Syria coverage is coming out of Beirut because you can't get in there. So how do, we, how do we help the people who are helping us? Well, there are a few things. Well, first of all, uh, well, first of all, we do have people in Syria sometimes now. This was, I was talking sure. more about last year. Um, but, uh, well, uh, there are a few different issues here. I'm going to focus on um, probably safety pri and primarily since that's what the, the biggest concern is. Um, so we actually have a set of guidelines that we have, that we've distributed internally about, um, and I'm talking primarily about amateur producers of content, not as much sort of regular freelancers, about how we interact with them surrounding dangerous or sensitive situations. Um, and that includes, just as Adam was talking about, we, we never ask them to spe specifically to gather something that will put them in danger. And, uh, and going a step further than that, we specifically tell them, you know, we, we urge them to stay safe and say, do not put yourself in danger for this. Do not do that for us. And then um, be, um, beyond that, and this actually comes back to the issue of, uh, of, of speed and, and how it balances against other factors. Um, we'll all make some very careful decisions when somebody is gathering this kind of content uh, you know, on, on their own in a dangerous situation where we may wait until the acute danger is passed before we reach out and before we start that process. Even though it may in some cases put us at a little bit of a competitive disadvantage, it's the safe thing to do and the ethical thing to do for them. And frankly, they're probably more likely to interact with us in that scenario anyway. I think we're going to be more successful. Um, and then we uh, go beyond that to um, beyond dangerous situations. And this isn't always just war zones. It often is, but it also is also um, we get a lot of amateur content related to natural disasters. And there are people who are in the middle of a hurricane who, you know, might be thinking about going outside to, to take some pictures and say, you know, we'll, we'll tell them, don't do that. Please don't do that for us or for yourself. Uh, and um, we're mostly looking at the content that's already been produced and deciding whether there's a way we can get, get rights to, to, to use that. And this also applies to what we call sort of sensitive situations that aren't necessarily dangerous situations. This has come up sometimes where there's somebody, after some kind of uh, attack, um, you know, Boston would be a good example of this, where there are people who have just lost a loved one and who everybody is trying to talk to them or to a member of the family to learn more about what happened, to get a photo of the person, uh, a piece of video that might have been around before. 
Um, it's a very, very delicate situation. There have been a lot of missteps by a lot of uh, members of the media in the past. And so, our, uh, so we have guidelines that sort of cover that as well. And in some cases, honestly, the answer is you just don't bother them. You just don't do it. Uh, you wait until they decide that they're ready to come forward, or you wait until there, there are at least indications of that, that they are reaching out, or you reach out in such a way that you, it's sometimes just in how you word your requests. And this is, gets very subtle, but instead of saying, you know, I'm sorry for your loss, got any pictures of your kid, mm. um, it, it, you, it, it can be something more along the lines of, if you, if you are, if you are, if you want to tell this, if you want to help us tell the story of your child, if you want to share this with us, let us know. You know, you, you sort of put it out there. And again, it's not as aggressively competitive, but it's more ethical. And, uh, I, and I think, frankly, it's going to be more successful most of the time. So that, I mean, that's the sort of the, the kind of danger and safety issue of it. But then, I mean, credit is crucial. And this is something that, again, goes back before social networks even existed, um, because we always thought about it in terms of freelancers, that, that we, we always credit everybody who contributes any kind of content um, for us, and it drives us crazy when others don't. Um, because it's, it still is all too common. And we credit them in the way that they are comfortable being credited, uh, you know, as you were talking about, Adam, um, th that they often want to be anonymous um, and, and or want to be credited by a username as opposed to their actual name, um, which is something we, it's not, it's something that we had to adjust to a little bit because it's not the way we would generally refer to somebody, um, but we do. So that's, that's important as well. And then uh, payment is, is a little bit of a, of a whole different issue because a lot of, uh, we have the same experience with the vast majority of people coming to us with amateur, with amateur content. It wouldn't even occur to them to want money. I mean, they are just begging for us to share their story with the world. And Syria is a good example of that. Um, and uh, other, other conflict zones, there are a lot of examples of that. I mean, frankly, a lot of the people who are trying to get us to put this content out, they're sometimes activist groups, and we have to work with them very, very carefully, and we have to put it, another reason we have to put that all in context, because they have a point of view, and they're trying to make a point, um, but, the, but, but money is the last thing on their mind. If somebody asks us for money, then we, you know, then as far as we're concerned, they become a freelancer, and, and we start that conversation. I will come back and, and ask a final question about money before we go to questions, but I just want Anthony to just pick up on that. Yeah, uh, the difference with my role is that, um, you know, Reuters has two sides to their business. They have the agency, which sells news uh, to our clients, the Washington Post, New York Times, et cetera. Uh, and then there's the consumer-facing side of Reuters, which is producing Reuters.com, and uh, almost uh, as another client of Reuters, taking some of the news from Reuters and then taking things from social media and other sources. Uh, and I work on that side. I work on the side where we're producing consumer-facing content. So I'm not producing content for The Wire. Uh, I'm acting sort of as uh, another group within Reuters. And, uh, and what I'm doing is I'm, I'm looking at what Reuters is uh, putting out there. I'm looking at what people are reporting in social media, taking some of that, and then going back to our journalists and our people who work on the photo desk, who work on the video desk, the people who are seeing all sorts of videos coming from different places, who are very close to uh, the reports that are going on in Syria, the things that are going on in uh, Bahrain. And they're working with their sources to verify the same way that Eric was talking about uh, with the gunfight in Dara. Um, and they can look and make those decisions and say, well, that, you know, that, that statute wasn't, it wasn't there uh, yesterday. It was knocked down two weeks ago. Those people can help me verify and vet the reports. Um, in terms of people that want to be paid or, uh, or people that are sending us content, it's always a different situation, just like Eric said. Some people just want to get it out there. They're not looking for any compensation. That's a very easy... Um, a uh, way for us to, to get content out. But again, the most important thing is that we verify that the content that they're sending us is what it purports to be. Um, so the payment thing comes up every so often, and then oftentimes those people will become uh, regular contributors, regular freelancers of ours, and uh, we start to build a relationship so that we have a constant flow of video, of photos, of reports from those freelancers. We, we really rely on people who are native to different regions around the world. We have some people that we we bring in from the US and then put them in different regions, but for the most part, Reuters really does rely on the people that live in these regions to do a majority of the reporting. You know, and then... Sorry, go on. I thought uh, it was so, and then the other aspect of this is that also working with, uh, with Mark at Storyful, because 
sometimes we want a second set of eyes. Sometimes we want someone outside of our newsroom to give us what uh, their take is on something and what they're seeing. So oftentimes I'll reach out to Mark and his team and I'll say, hey, we're seeing this video or we're seeing this photo. Uh, what do you guys know about it? Uh, do you have any additional information? So we really try to collaborate outside of our newsroom. And, and the fact that we are a separate part of Reuters that kind of lives off in its own little world, we, we, we are able to be a little more collaborative and, and bring in different sources. Um, you know, I'll, I'll even go out to the AP, I'll see what the AP is reporting. We pull in tweets from the AP sometimes. Sometimes the AP has something that Reuters doesn't have. We don't care. We'll pull that report in and we want to, you know, we want to be the beacon for all news. We don't want to be just the beacon for Reuters news. And as long as we can verify and make sure that it's correct, we want to pull in all those different sources. Uh, related to what you were saying about um, establishing kind of regular sources, I think that's an important point that that applies to amateur content as well in a lot of cases. And that's something that can uh, be, you know, we're talking, speaking of time, can be a real time saver in some cases. We have, Siri is a good example, where there are some regular sources of content that um, we may get video from from time to time. So what we do is we, we establish contact with them. We figure, we learn who they are uh, to the best of our ability. We at least feel, feel like there's a baseline of standards there. We're always going to have to develop verify every single piece of content from them to make sure it actually is what it claims to be. Um, but at least we, we, we know we're at a decent starting point. And importantly, we also, in most cases, will get blanket permission to use any of their content without having to bother with that. So we don't have to worry about the legal side of it because we've been given sort of permanent permission to, to use any content coming from that particular source. Let's think of this as the Perugia Manifesto, right? This is the day, that perhaps <laughs> what we do, right? Is we stop talking and we start thinking about action points that we can start with today. And the first thing I would say, and I don't want to blow smoke up these gentlemen's behinds here, but I've worked with obviously Antti for years, I know Eric for years, um, these guys are the, the gold standard, right, when it comes to verification, contact, credit, all those things. But a lot of people in the media business do a bloody awful job of crediting people who create journalism, and I'm talking about that second category. So have you ever seen, and this is my first action point, whenever you see a TV station, TV broad broadcast, the words credit YouTube, <laughs> right? Which is like yes. credit telephone, right? Awful. Internet. Awful. Internet, you know, web, <laughs> right? Turn off that television. A person right? on the phone. person on the phone, right? Yeah. If you see a newspaper saying credit Twitter, don't buy the newspaper, right? <laughs> the second thing I would say is that we need to also remember that there's a great joy and beauty in storytelling on, in this area now. So we have an example last week where we had a man who witnessed the West Texas explosion uh, from his car. You remember the explosion, the terrible explosion? We, we talked to him, we managed his video because we have a relationship with YouTube where we manage videos. We don't get money out of it. What we do is we insist that man gets a credit. We handle any press queries about the man. We also, in the end of the day, found this incredible story behind this guy, you know, and his, his kids are in the car with him. And so he goes on television, talks about it, and suddenly this piece of content becomes an incredible story. And I just think that's what, you know, we talk a lot about sort of responsibilities and money, but that's really in the end of the day where the value is, is to be able to see citizen journalism as so multi-layered and rich. Uh, and we are the people, the storytellers professionally, who take those people, work with them, and make them sing, you know? I mean, make these things. That was the first thing I was said, my first front page story when I was a newspaper reporter was make it sing. And I just think right now, if we do it right, is it's it, 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 Does it basically rich. come down to a very simple credit where it's due? No, it's more than that. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's about actually practical things as well, as I say. So for example, in YouTube, if you have a piece of video that's of a disaster, you don't get advertising revenue out of that because YouTube says disaster, we're not gonna make money out of this. But if someone robs that video, puts it up on their own channel, they get advertising, right? So we're working with YouTube to try and stop that, to make sure that doesn't happen. And so it's more than credit. It's, it's about saying what practical steps can we make to put that individual who got that story, the source, front and center. And it's about a whole series of incentives financially uh, to do a credit, but it's, it's much bigger simply than credit, I think. Mark Little's Perugia Declaration will be on the Storyful blog this evening, I hope. Well, no, it's 140 characters, so like, <laughs> it has to be. It's a good place to go for questions. Let's hope, uh, sorry, sorry, I before we move on, I, I wonder if there's going to be a, uh, a change where we start to see freelancers and people who are the primary captures of this content to start to hold back some stuff because they want to be compensated. They, they realize that they're putting out a lot of this stuff out there for other people to take and maybe they get credit for it. They may, maybe someone properly credits them. But I, I think what, as we're moving towards this age where it's almost all, everything's digital, everything's being done uh, through social networks, 
are they going to start to pull back a little bit more? Well, what I'd like to see is that they do, you know. I think that some people should actually get money where at the moment they just are happy for credit. So we'd like to see, for example, in YouTube, we manage videos that, you know, get millions of views and we give money back to the uploader because of a system that YouTube have. But let's say an action point would maybe, let's say, you know, you guys, we could sign up to the idea that we'll create a public service license, right, for certain really important content where let's list all the things we'd like to give to the uploader. So definitely credit the ability to archive in the future. So, you know, the first 72 hours when you get an iconic image or video, you want it out there and we as journalists don't want to have restrictions on that. But, you know, that's valuable content in the long term. So should that person get the ability to make money in 72 hours? Things like this, these are issues. And I think this year, if I could appeal to my colleagues here and to all of you guys, is let's work on the definition of that public service license. It has to be more sophisticated than Creative Commons because there's a lot more issues involved in it. But let's see if we can develop that. And I mean, we would, sorry if we'd be putting an idea out there in a few weeks' time about this, but I'd love if we could kind of crowdsource, to use a horrible phrase, the elements of a contract between a citizen who witnesses something and all the organizations that will then use that video. Um, and I think if we could come out of 2013 with that, that would be a major step forward. Good action plan. Let's go to the floor and questions. At the back. Thanks, guys. It's been a great panel. Um, I, I had a question for you, which is, do you think there's a place for building tools? So it seems to me, we just produced a tool where the idea is to actually see software as the new hardware. You know, actually build an app that is not to control content and create your own social network, to, but to actually curate the content at the point of production, make it easier to find, look better. You know, is, is this a, a something that, that you think agencies would be interested in building or are considering building already? This is a question of craft skills, improving craft skills for the people who are gathering the content. Yeah, and, and whether there's, there's a place for creating sort of focusing more on, on tools that will improve people's content rather than each person creating. I mean, there's a platform for demotics, there's a platform for blotter, uh, Storyful has, you know, all of these things, they're closed because it's competitive. But that doesn't actually help the greater sort of... I, I want to see something like that do well. In the past, I don't think it's been successful. Um, I think an example is iReport with CNN, um, which I think is a wonderful thing and I think it's presented really well, but they, I don't see uh, enough content being sent to something like that where it gets um, a, a massive scale. Uh, and I'm not trying to blow smoke up your ass either, <laughs> but I think the idea of going out and finding the really great uh, newsworthy content has been a better model to instead of waiting for people to bring things in to go out and find the things put it in an easier to uh, navigate uh, set of channels has been the better model I would like to see the other mo other model become more successful hopefully you're uh, you're able to be the first success story uh, on that side of things but I uh, think the thing that uh, if you're able to accomplish that would be really important is what Mark is looking for is being able to integrate some sort of license into that, into that software. So it makes it easy to distribute that content and not lose the person's ability to monetize it if they want to. Yeah, I think it's a really important point that Anthony's made, and I think you make as well, is that uh, one of the great things about this conference, this festival, is that you get to meet people you think are your competitors, they're actually your collaborators. Like, we just had lunch there with Source Fabric and Liquid News, uh, two other great sort of, not startups is the wrong word, in this ecosystem. Um, we found out we were talking about this, and the big thing we agreed on was that we shouldn't silo user content. So too many mistakes have been made by these user content units within big organizations where they want to take it, you know, give it to me. Don't put it on YouTube. Give it to me in whatever organization it is, rather than saying, okay, it exists on YouTube. How do we then siphon that into our new systems through an open source tool? And I would love to see a kind of a standard CMS where, you know, every newsroom could essentially take the verification system or the citizen journalism CMS, plug it into their own uh, newsroom, and we all work to the same standard. So let's standardize the tools. Some of them will be paid for. They have to be. But there will have to also be, um, you know, public comments here as well. And I, I would, I'd love to chat to you about what you're doing because I think all of us who are creating this ecosystem, who are not big news organizations, have a responsibility 
to, to share some of this innovation and then obviously take the stuff that's proprietary and make money out of it. That's the way good systems develop, I think. To, to play devil's advocate, is there a danger that everybody's news is going to look very similar if you take that model? No, no, because I think that's the key thing about value in this new ecosystem, right? Is that um, every newspaper and every news agency and every TV station will be marked by the quality of the context they add. So the source material may be the same. So every newspaper covers essentially the same stories, but they do it in a different way. And that's, I think, what will happen is that we'll see UGC or user content, uh, the same sources will pop up, but news organizations will make money and value out of treating them differently, adding different context. And I think that's where the value is in this new system. Uh, and you were talking about um, Jeff Jarvis earlier, but Jeff, about five years ago, made a point that everybody thought was entirely ridiculous, which is, you know, we're all in a major news event, all the news organizations are going to have to cover it. They're all there. They're all there with their cameras. It costs a fortune of wasted energy. And so Jeff's line was, share it and go and cover the serious stuff yourselves. Differentiate elsewhere. The fascinating thing now about my great love affair with Twitter is that it's obviated that whole question. It's already done, right? What's happened is that the major news events are being covered by everybody else. You absolutely rightly describe value as being added by context. But what it does eventually in this pared down news environment is it forces news organizations to think of the stuff that they do really well, which is potentially the long form. It is the investigative, it is everything else. So actually... Or they you, just shape it off the bottom line and get rid of the people who were doing that before. Yeah, which would be a pity. Yeah, but remember, I mean, one of the reasons I did what I'm doing now is I remember being in Afghanistan covering uh, in Kandahar, and I couldn't move outside the guest house I was in to talk to people. And if I did get out there and I used to disguise ourselves to get out, we did it through a fixer who translated for us. And I remember thinking at the time, this is a real waste. And I had to run back and I had 90 seconds to describe what I'd seen, which was ridiculous as well. And I thought to myself, what if I didn't have to worry about getting to my satellite feed point? What if I didn't have to worry about the breaking news aspect of my job? What if I could just go out there for days and embed myself in that community? And on my screen, I could see all the chatter around and all the user content that was surrounding it. And what I basically did with Storyful was I built what I would have liked as a foreign correspondent. Um, the ability to take all the breaking news content and say, someone else has taken care of that. Someone else is monitoring the chatter. I'm going to do the long form. I'm going to do the in-depth and investigative stuff that I can't do because I'm locked on this bloody hotel roof, feeding the same thing again and again. And the dirty secret, by the way, is you're on the phone to your people back in, in my case, Dublin, saying, what are Reuters and AP reporting about where I am? Um, and I know that sounds ridiculous, but that happens, you know? And then you suddenly have someone jumping up, putting on their bulletproof vest because they see an explosion happen behind them, do a piece of the camera. It's so unnatural and inauthentic that sometimes when people talk about the old days, it makes me want to vomit. Uh, there's a lot of... Match. Need to match. And, there you go. Sorry, but that's probably... And those of us who have worked in foreign news will, will know the most dreaded sentence in the English language is, the way we see the story from London, or the way we see the story in Dublin, <laughs> is this, when you're in the field. Uh, Brian Connolly is uh, the person who asked that question. Small World News is his organisation. Storymaker is the platform, and I'm sure he'd be happy to talk to you. Let's take some more questions. No questions. Okay, we'll go back. Oh, right there. oh sorry. I mean, maybe you've answered this question already in a way, but uh, I mean, there's more and more fact checking to be made because there's more news coming in from citizens out there and from social networks and stuff, and less money because, I mean, at least in Italy, journalism is financed uh, less and less and less. So how do you put these two things together? I mean, in Italy, even um, web uh, magazines and newspapers have trouble finding advertising. So, I mean, do you see a danger in this? I mean, journalists being encouraged by the fact that they're paid very little, you know, being encouraged to just take for granted news coming from citizen journalism or social media rather than checking them. I mean, I, I just want to, I didn't mention it, but I, I, that touches on a point that um, the Guardian, some of the criticisms of the new Guardian Witness website in the UK were made. Uh, the NUJ, uh, the National Union of Journalists in the UK said if you're providing core content to a newspaper, the NUJ believes it should be paid for. It's, it's, but is there a danger that, that news organizations strapped for cash see citizen journalism, call it what you will, social journalism, as a chance to get something for nothing? Well, to, 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 can we 
witnessing? Witnessing? Yeah. Witnessing. Witnesses. Let's say witnessing rather than sitting Nice one. Journalists. Let's add that to the That's declaration. Cool. Yeah, so the declaration. The declaration, I think we should have, we should have uh, staff journalists. Let's cut the word professional out of this because the professionalism is a sliding scale of talent and dedication. So staff journalists, freelancers, and witnesses. And I think that the, my sense of a lot of the tools that uh, Brian was talking about, many of the, the core uh, contributors to, to Adam's blotter, your regular contributors out of Syria, they, they sit on this sliding scale. They perhaps start as the witness and then move as they, get, as they improve. They become, they become freelancers in, that, in this gray space. But and then, so any tools that you can use to improve them, that they can learn to improve their work should be obviously... Um, obviously lauded. I think also one point I would make this be, you know, doing what we do is cheaper now than it ever has been. So, you know, I remember going to Iraq in 2003, we spent 9,000 euro in excess baggage just for equipment for a two-person team. Um, it wasn't just Ryanair doing it, but it was, it was basically, you know, we were actually paying a lot of money to transport all this gear, and now, you know, with a tablet and a couple of extra bits and pieces, I could do the same job. So there's a lot of money being saved in reporting the world these days. I would say that that's not recognized as one of the, the benefits of citizen journalism, as we call it. The second thing as well, I would say, is that there are ways of monetizing that are emerging that I think we should pay attention to. I think watch what happens on YouTube with its advertising model. It's going to be very interesting at ways they raise advertising rates so that if you do a piece of video that gets 10,000 views, you get more than 15 cent. You know? And I think there's going to be ways that'll happen. Uh, I would like to see, again, I wish all my colleagues success in these platforms that reward people for doing good journalism. And I think hyper-local is going to be really interesting. I would love to see networks of motivated activists covering city politics um, and finding ways uh, to get money back in their hands as well. So I think too much time and energy is put into pointless debates about old versus new. New media is media, and we just got to work out the tools and the action points and the principles that are going to underpin the new business model. Um, so I share your fear, but I would also say let's all together share determination to try and answer those questions because they are, they're not rocket science. Adam, do you want to pick up on that? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll, I'll answer your question a little bit more directly if I can. Um, so I, I actually think that like, like us all, journalists have to be smarter these days. And what you've got with witness news um, or freelance news is you've got a, a, an abundance of content that you otherwise wouldn't have had access to five or six years ago. Um, so as a journalist, um, you're, you're being asked to, to be first and be right. You're asked to break content and, 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 or get footage that your, your competitors aren't getting. Um, you, you know, you're, you're, there's lots of demands, and at the same time, you are being told there isn't the resource and, and, and the money to, to throw at this as you were five or six years ago. Um, but what wi eyewitness news and, and, and freelancers are able to provide for you is an abundance of content that will help you um, break that news first and, and, and get it right, um, or, or cover stuff. So, in, in our instance, we were, we launched as a breaking news service and very quickly realised that. You know, there are other people that do that. If you want breaking news, you're probably going to go to... Well, not CNN anymore, but, um, <laughs> you know, you, you would have gone somewhere else. Um, BBC. Whereas, <laughs> well, well, anyway. Um, and what we now focus on is, is actually uncovering footage that you're not going to see anywhere else. So while people are focusing on Damascus, for example, um, we're going to uncover footage from Damascus that others aren't getting. And that is a really nice compliment to the, the newsroom. And that's how, you know, I think that, that's kind of where you need to focus. Yeah, I think that's exactly it. I mean, we, we need to think about these as, as complementary sources of information. Um, uh, you know, when we get um, the, f for the mo when we're getting great amateur content uh, that we end up distributing at AP, it, it's it, you know, it's not like we're saying like, oh, you know what? They're going to be people there with cameras, so let's not send someone. You know, it, it's not like we're making. It's, it's not like that's the thought process at all. It's more that they're in the right place at the right time, and no news organization, no matter how large, is always going to be in the right place at the right time. In fact, they're usually not. Um, and uh, and you know, we we're still there to provide the context, to provide the expertise, to authenticate, and this is really important. I, the verification piece of this is so so crucial. And in fact, yes, the best thing is to have a person on the ground witnessing something. 
Stephen, uh, uh, maybe it sounds like sacrilege to say it, but somebody who is professional, who, who uh, can I, I'm not supposed to say professional journalist, staff journalist. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody who is an experienced, seasoned uh, uh, journalist, let's say, who happens to be there at the right time, I'm sorry, but they're going to do even better because this is what they do for a living. And so there still is value in having that person there. In fact, we have some situations where we see a lot of amateur content from somewhere. We're looking to use it. In fact, we often do. But at the same time, it may also help guide our reporting. We may decide to send people there as a result or not send people there as a result because we realize, okay, we've got that piece covered and we can, and we can expand from there. It's an incredible tool, but I don't think, I don't think one, I don't think one thing is replacing another. Yeah, the, the efficiencies are recognized, but not by enough organizations, especially the big ones, and that's why they're having so much trouble trying to compete and, and, and profit. Um, but with the other side of this that we're not uh, acknowledging is that where's the business model? And that's always been the, the huge elephant in the room that no one's really been able to figure out. You know, we may be able to get our costs down, but now how do we generate revenue by producing Journalism. I don't know what's going on. Um, <laughs> so I think the ad, I think the ad model is broken. I think we all recognize that. So we need to figure out what's what. What, what is the next thing? How are we going to generate revenue through all this reporting that we're doing? And that's probably another panel. I mean, you, we were talking, you were talking about business models. That, that original question was about the cost of verifying, right? It was a very specific question. If I understood you right, about the cost of verification, and um, I think also. Yeah. So, Adam, you've, you've got, you just said, I'm bowled over by that number, 300,000 people who you, th who you reckon you kind of know, right? You guys are being shipped in an enormous amount of data. You see, I don't know, I don't know what the BBC is in terms of picture desk, but the Guardian is now 20,000 images a day coming from all over the place, and they're able to go through it. There are now, the, the tools available to verify are getting better and better and better. It's a combination of human. It's always the end call is a human call. And at Demotics, we had a network of editors 24-7, 365, looking at every single piece of content that came through. But an enormous number of tools which helped us filter what the key things we needed to be looking at from a verification perspective were. And that's what those funnels have got much, much, much more efficient. And the cost now of verification, it's always ultimately human. But actually, from a financial perspective, it's actually extremely low and it's dropping. And I would make a comparison to the emergence of personal computers where, you know, to begin with, you wouldn't think every person would build their own computer system, right? You know, we all, we all consume basically uh, brands, you know, so what I would say to you is if we could have some way of having a lot of the verification techniques, tools, uh, best practice essentially shared over all of these different organizations rather than each one thinking they have to reinvent the wheel every time they approach this, this problem, it would be much better. Again, my point about silos. Because of the old competitive um, demands of the old news business, you know, news organizations want their own systems. And I think maybe if there was a standardization of verification techniques and technology um, supplied by an ecosystem of companies like you know, the smaller companies here today, then I think we'd make progress cheaper and faster. Um, that, that's my advert for young startups in this area. So. Gentlemen there with a question. If you do have a question, do catch my eye, otherwise we will just chatter until we run out of time. Okay, hi, I'm Jus Sipulner from Helsinki Sanomat in Helsinki, Finland. Uh, I, was, I was just wanted to ask, you sort of described an ecosystem where you have like a lot of citizen sources and then like a professional layer of journalism there verifying it. But don't you think that um, sort of institutions or the government or companies actually have an interest to do the verification or the annulment of the rumors themselves and sort of leave the uh, uh, journalists out of the picture? I, I was thinking about the Boston thing where people actually were spreading very widely the, wrong, the name of someone who was falsely claimed to be the suspect that would actually be probably land you in court in Finland and probably in America, but the privacy laws differ in different countries. But, but anyway, don't you think the police in this situation actually had the uh, sort of, it, was in the, it would have been in their interest to directly say that the information is false? And could you extrapolate this to a lot of situations, actually, of similar nature, where false information or information of any kind is spreading through uh, the social web? I think we're seeing more of that. Um, and Boston in particular, you saw the Boston police, you saw the Boston FBI. A lot of these official sources are doing uh, their own social media and going direct. Uh, so the, the commonly known term is the sources going direct now. Um, and I think in more events, you're going to see exactly what happened with Boston. They, they didn't jump on 
the name that was being floated out there. Um, and they may have done that for another reason. They, maybe they didn't want to uh, have that name float out there even further by, by even acknowledging that it was there. And that's another thing that we have to recognize. When do we jump in and recognize that there's uh, a, a, a wrong piece of information, um, not giving it more credit than it should, but should, is it already out there so far that we want to knock it down? Uh, NBC wound up knocking that rumor down, so they felt that it was propagated so far that someone had to step in and say this is not correct. Um, but going back to what you were saying, I do think that we're going to see, you know, official sources doing a lot more direct uh, reporting via social networks because that's where people are directing their attention more and more instead of going to traditional news sources. Do you sense that that's something that uh, large institutions are very good at doing it or is that still in its infancy? Um, I think it depends on the uh, institution, where it's located, you know, how technologically savvy they are. I think it's probably easier in large metropolitan areas where they're probably a little more digital savvy. That may not always be the case. Sometimes there are small towns that, you know, are, are very, very digital savvy. And I, I, before I even go to look for sources, non-traditional sources, I'm, I'm trying not to use citizen journalists anymore. Uh, <laughs> Instead of going to non-traditional sources, uh, I first look for the official sources that are putting out reports uh, via social media. And just picking up the phone is, you know, the, the best way to do it. Um, and if, uh, if they're not posting uh, on Twitter, on Facebook, I'll also see if there's people in the newsroom who have uh, people who are... Uh, related to that story uh, who are official st sources. It may not be someone at the sheriff's department. It may be uh, someone who is the press officer that I'll, I want to get the contact information for. But I think, I think examples that are uh, popping up during these big breaking events are making other uh, uh, metropolitan areas and different towns and cities uh, decide that it does become more useful for them to put their information out themselves rather than wait for the news organizations or for citizens to put that information out. So I think, there's, uh, I think there is certainly incentive for a lot of government uh, institutions in particular to try to, to separate right from wrong. The question is when do they want to disclose that information to the public and when do they want to keep it to themselves? And that's another place where, you know, we professionals, I'm not going to say professional journalists, I'll just say professionals now, um, where, where we need to, to step in and, and be really aggressive and work with our sources to try to, to dig that up. And, you know, because uh, a, a lot of times they may, you know, they may knock down the incorrect information, but they may have a lot of correct information that they may not necessarily be willing to share. And we need to be aggressive, aggressive reporters, just like we always have been. Mm. I, I only half heard the question because of the echo in this part of the room, but um, one of the things we haven't touched on, the, the last talk in this room was a fabulous talk about BuzzFeed, which gets something like 40, we would, we would, 40 million uniques, but we were shown one story which had had um, uh, a uh, 7.5% uptick, no, 7.5 times uptick through sharing. So, um, and what that points to is the fact that something we haven't spoken about, which is the citizens, the witnesses, they're not just there for the sourcing. They're not just there shipping content in. They now own your front page. They're the ones pushing it out. They're, the, they're your splash. And you can put a story on page... You can, as, as morally and as sensibly as you want, put an important political story on page one or on your the lead, lead, of your lead broadcast. Uh, if the story about Lady Gaga is more attractive on page five, that's your front page in terms of page views. So that, we've also lost control of distribution. That's also been, been, been pushed out. And that's a whole different ballgame with enormous moral correlations. And I think just back to the original question about how we cover government sources on social media, I mean, in, in many ways, there's a real model here around the pool report. So, you know, uh, when I was, I was working in Washington, D.C., we worked together. We took pool reports because not every news organization could have an individual reporter following the president. And I think that's a good example. I think AP started because a collaboration of, you know, uh, news organizations in New York didn't want to send to cover the Spanish-American War, right? That's so right, they, right, right. So they, they, they said, well, let's just send one of us. And it was a very simple notion at the time, and, you know, we'll send it back by telegram, and a few days later we can... You know, so how about this, and adding this to the declaration, right? Could we have a chat room? Is there a way, for example, because you guys can't go out and say, hey, it's, it's Anthony or Eric here, uh, do you think this video is right or wrong, or is this fact right or wrong? Because you guys have got a reputational damage immediately, that happens. But if you could step into a room together and say, 
like when the account was hacked last week, the AP account, you know, listen guys, don't believe a word that's said from here on in with the account or, you know, if there could be a chat room where we could get together and assess things like the scanner information. Uh, the only way to do that right now is to say it publicly on Twitter, but what if we had a sort of professional, I don't know what to call them now that we're disputing every language. <laughs> I take it all back. I take it all back. <laughs> what if we could have a chat room? Like, you know, we use Yammer internally in our company, uh, which is a network that allows you to, like almost in a Facebook feed, share information um, privately and I think that could be a big way of doing it that we'd have almost a pool system. Eric and Anthony, if you told, went to your bosses and said oh, we're talking to each other all the time and collaborating on stories, would that, is that an idea that would fly over? they say don't be so ridiculous, they're the competition. It's easier for me to do because I don't work for the, the agency side of the business. So I would be perfectly happy to work with Eric on something like that. I think Eric's uh, business and AP is more, well I'll let you speak for yourself, but I think they're more rooted in the agency model, where I'm off on the consumer model. Yeah, I would. I think the answer to that would probably be no. Um, being perfectly honest, and yeah, it is. I mean, we we do have a little bit of a consumer presence in, the, in in our app and in our social presence, but by and large, we are wholesalers of news, and um, and it's important to remember we are collectively owned by American newspapers and broadcasters, and uh, and ultimately, you know, they. They, I mean, they, that's who our board is, you know, and so um, we need to keep that into consideration. And so it's important for us to, um, so we need to be competitive with those who, you know, with, with Reuters and with AFP and Bloomberg and CNN and everybody else. And, um, and so that, I, I think that would, that probably honestly wouldn't fly, you know. But, if you but, there, but there might be, I mean, you know, there might be aspects of it too. There are times when we have, you know, when conversations have taken place behind the scenes, uh, an ex a good example of this is when, uh, and this is a situation where we probably would talk to Reuters and maybe even have in the past, if there is a journalist who is in some kind of danger, if they've been kidnapped, uh, it's a situation where we, because of the details of the situation, we don't want it to be reported yet. Um, there might be a conversation that might happen along back channels saying, look, you're going to hear new uh, reports about this. And, and there's almost, the, you know, it's almost sort of an unwritten code that, uh, you know, that we're all going to work together and communicate together to make sure that the decisions are made so that this, that this person is not uh, endangered in any way. So that's a very extreme example. So I, I don't know if we could wiggle uh, in the way of uh, a toward a sort of normal day-to-day -day journalism. But if you, if you went to your bosses and say, okay, we're going to collaborate with Reuters, AFP, whoever it may be, and the end result will be better for AP by collaborating, then, then surely that's, they benefit in the end. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I'll bring it up. Uh, I'll bring it up. At the, I'll bring it up when I get back to back to New York. We'll come back but, with our uh, notes next yeah. year on Eric that. Carvin, the soon-to-be former social media editor of AP. <laughs> um, before I ask a final question, if we've got any more questions in the room, I'll uh, we'll take them. Otherwise, I'll just ask a final question. Anybody? No. Oh, gentleman on the left. Uh, just wait for the microphone, if you would. Uh, well, I uh, do work in a press agency, in a news agency, uh, Italian, uh, it is La Press, and um, I uh, totally agree that probably in the future the, uh, the role of the journalist must uh, more and more be uh, to verify the sources and, and, and check the facts. But uh, at the same time, uh, our daily work um, has to do with the fact that um, uh, the newspapers, they have less and less money to pay for the, for the news and uh, there's a, um, a growing number of websites that they just want to be filled from, uh, 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 with news and they want to be filled very fast and they, didn't, they do not care really very much about the quality and you have a lot of uh, other players in the market that do the same work you do. So uh, uh, what the, the market presses you to do is uh, make a, 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 a lot of news uh, fast uh, uh, and so uh, you, you push out the story and go to the next. So uh, my question is, do you think is there um, uh, room for the role you are, um, you, are, you are defining here, you think in the future journalists could really be what you are uh, defining. So it's a question of what, where's the role for quality journalism? I, I, I think, does it sort of boil it down? Yeah. Anybody want to pick up on that? This is, a, this is a problem. I mean, it's absolutely a very big problem and a really important question because there is a lot of financial incentive to just, to just dump a lot of volume out there 
um, for a lot of news sites, and news, news sources, uh, for agri a lot of aggregators in particular. And um, I worry sometimes that I see, what I, I see what I think of some news organizations being pulled in that direction a little bit. And I sometimes see what I, you know, again, it, it has to do with that speed versus uh, accuracy thing. It relates to that too, where, where um, you know, just kind of shoveling it out there and, and then, you know, sort of shoot and ask questions later uh, is, I hope that translates into Italian, um, that that is, um, that, that could be interfering with the practice of quality journalism. There needs to be more financial incentive to getting it right. And I think there is a fair amount. I mean, I think, um, I think when a big news organization has a big misstep, it, it really, it's a pretty significant mark in their reputation uh, for some time. Does it mean that they lose customers? I think that's a really open question, you know? I mean, does, I, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to think of all the, I mean, we've made our share of mistakes, Reuters has, everybody else has too, and I'm, I'm trying to think of, of specific examples of a lot of people pulling away for that reason, and I don't really think of them, and that, that, maybe that's a little troubling, you know? Maybe people should walk away when they see those big mistakes, and when they see, you know, poor quality journalism, and, you know, there's a lot about how reporting takes place online, um, a lot of independent reporting that happens online has this problem too. Um, there's a lot of, there's a, uh, it's something that troubles me about, about the way a lot of blogging um, works and there's no reason that it has to. I believe that a blog is simply a format. You put into it what you want. Um, but there, but you see a lot of very, um, you, you see a lot of blogging that doesn't really follow the general principles of journalism where you'll, uh, you'll say very harsh things about somebody without trying to talk to them, for example. That's something that we see all the time and, and it, it's, it's very frustrating. But there's no, I, I worry that there's not enough disincentive toward that, that sort of thing. Uh, and I CNN think, is a probably so. a perfect CNN example. CNN got their highest viewing figure since 91? Exactly. Yeah. CNN got the highest viewing figure since 1991 for its poor coverage of the Boston bombings. In that, given that, where's the place for quality, accuracy? Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, the, right now, I think what's happening with social media as a distribution network is that people don't go there necessarily right now, first place. They, they, you know, their destination is still turn on the television. Um, and turn on CNN. That's their instinct because that's the way we were kind of brought up in this media television age. I think more and more social media will be the destination, the first place you go. If you know that you're going to get the most authentic view, you'll go there. I think the, to key to your question and answering that is to realize I think the, the role of journalism will probably be split into a kind of a binary one, I would suspect, where you'll have the people who are you know, essentially managing the overabundance of information the people who are sitting there watching all the sources coming into them, people at the moment like Eric and you know, Anthony, and then there'll be another group who are the ones adding the value in the context that is the differentiator for the organization. So you go to the New York Times because it does a better job than the New York Post at context. Um, and I think that's going to be the way it'll happen. We have that binary breaking news journalist pulling in the sources. Um, the thing about high volume, I think it's only a danger if everyone's trying to get something exclusive. Um, in that case, you know, we own this fact. John King on CNN, I've just talked to a law enforcement official and I got it completely wrong. You know, the thing there is his desire to have something exclusive, a scoop. I think once that starts to fade away, uh, and we know that we're always going to be scooped by Twitter and social media, then we can, I think, start to talk seriously about this binary you know, system of journalism. I mentioned your blog a few times, and, and I, was, I, I, I completely understand what you're saying about the death of the scoop. Do you honestly, as a, as, a, as a journalist who's worked in social media and in traditional media, do you honestly think the day will come where journalists are not going to want to skip their rivals? No, I mean, anyone talking in extremes about black or white when it comes to these issues and the evolution of, our bus uh, of, of journalism uh, is wrong. I'm not saying that at all. What I am saying is this. Uh, someone made a point to me that they were in Boston on the day of the bombing. Uh, and they were literally on 5 a.m. watching what was happening on Twitter, and they went to get the newspaper, USA Today, which looked like it was from weeks before, you know? And, and that contrast between what social media can provide and journalists native to social media and the old ways of breaking scoops is making, frankly, for my daughter's generation, she's, uh, you know, eight years old and starting to become aware of news, um, you know, she's not going to turn on the television ever again in breaking news scenario. She won't look to the newspaper for her first port of call for news. Now, hopefully she'll turn on TV and newspapers to get context, but let's re realize that, you know, generationally CNN might still be the draw today. I don't think that's going to be the case for my daughter when she's growing up. I think it depends on the who the audience is. Uh, who gets the news first is important to people who are uh, working as traders or pe pe uh, people who 
who use the Bloomberg terminal or the, or the Reuters terminal, that speed is very important to those type of consumers. I think the general news consumer, if you polled someone on the street and asked them who broke a story, I would bet you nine times out of ten they wouldn't know who broke a certain story. So for the general news consumer, I don't think it's as important. When you're selling news to someone who's making money off that news, it, it is very important how quickly you can get that news out and, and if you can beat your competitors at it. I, I have actually wondered for a long time if anybody has ever cared who reported something first, regardless of, of whether we're in the social digital world here. And I think... Uh, uh, for us, there actually always has been value, and this is probably true for the other side of Reuters too, because our customers are news organizations, and so you know when they decide whether they want to be customers, they want to see that they're getting material from us quickly. But I think the um, I think it's true to an extent, as Mark's saying. I think the scoop is going to become less relevant less of the time. You know, it'll be relevant less of the time. But uh, I think maybe the, there will just be more of a shift that's already happening now, where the scoop is going to be the great investigative piece. It's going to be the one where you're you're putting the work in. For, for days or weeks or even months and then not only, you know, it, instead of being able to just say, well, we got this two minutes before our competitors, you can say, we got the story and nobody else will ever report it other than to try to follow it up tomorrow once they can start sourcing up. I completely agree. Completely. I talk about a scoop in the context of breaking news, but, right. you know, breaking Watergate, that's a scoop mm. I want to see continued forever. Yeah. Yes. So, sure, you want to pick and, it up? And, and, and I back that up. I, I agree with you 100%, and I hope that that happens too. So that's a, that's a hope and agreement, which is a perfect combination. Um, the, You're getting soft in your old age. I, <laughs> I think the key point is also there's not going to be any financial incentive anymore for this scoop business because it's already out there. If, you, if, it, if that whole business has been taken over by its social, and you, we are our daughter's generation, mine's six years old because you're older than me, um, uh, is going to be getting, when, when a breaking news event ha happens, they'll hear it because their Facebook will pop or their Twitter will pop or it'll be something else in 20 years' time. Um, that has no more value because we, you've just said something which nobody has ever been able to understand, is that we talk in a very close shop almost all our lives to journalists about journalism. And we did this for years with Twitter. I'm sure you guys you know, were culpable of this terribly. You get all your news from Twitter, which means everybody else gets all their news from right. Twitter. You talk to anybody who's still in the... TV business, and they'll say, no, no, everybody still gets the news from television. <laughs> and we have to be reminded of this. Yeah. But that shift will shift. The shift will happen. And when people go to Twitter to see a breaking news event, they have n there is no source. Mm -hmm. There's just the yeah. data. There's just that 140 characters. It doesn't matter to them, and there's no value to it because everybody's repeating it. So the only financial value is in the other stuff. And that's a fabulous situation. To there's, be one in. Of, there's one other exception that is important to remember, which is that when news breaks, it's not always something that happens publicly. There is breaking news that happens behind the scenes, behind closed doors, and, and that's where you still, as a professional journalist, can, um, can, can still really make your mark when you, when you break news. It's not always an investigative piece. It's just when you did a good job developing your sources, and then you get word of something first that did not happen publicly. Um, I think there's still some value of that. But again, in the long run, is the average person going to care who broke it? Eh, probably not. I think Slate uh, gave some good advice after the Boston Marathon coverage where they said uh, you'd be better off turning off your television, unplugging your PC and going in cleaning your gutters and picking up a newspaper the next day to find out what had happened in Boston. I mean, we, we, <laughs> We're all in the news business. We, 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 we're there because we love news. But actually, I find myself in some ways agreeing with that sentiment. That we're, we're, we're just following this stuff too closely now. Do we, do we just need to just... Do we need to back off a little and just yeah, say... I, mean, I find myself having a real battle every day thinking, you know, I'm getting so ADHD, you know, I'm like, it's all coming at me and I do get tired and sometimes on a, on a Saturday I'll just read a book and just turn off Twitter. Um, <laughs> on but a Kindle I, or... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I actually physically luxuriate in the kind of feel of it, but uh, <laughs> I think one of the interesting things for me is the journals I admire greatly, and I, I wrote that blog post about a guy called Ernie Pyle, who was a war correspondent in the Second World War, and the great strength of his reporting was that he would take these small little details that other people had missed um, in the case of Normandy, the Normandy landings, where he saw the bodies floating in the water. He didn't really describe them directly. What he said was, there's jellyfish among them, and in the middle is a four-leaf clover. You know, good luck, hell yes. And it's the most evocative thing. I'm transported right there through his eyes, and that was 60 years ago. It still stands the test of time. That, for me, is the scoop. You know, when a journalist, taking a few days to consider a situation, mm -hmm. comes up with an observation or a detail that someone else has missed that then defines the story forevermore. Um, and I, I think there's a huge role for that, and that is against my social media evangelism. I know, but it's, it's a great, complicated, big grey world we live in, and there'll be a great, hopefully, place for that kind of scoop as we go forward. Charlie Beckett at the back, Professor Charlie Beckett. 
A final question if you, from you before we wrap. Yeah, it's not a question actually, Stuart. Um, it's just a, an offer, really. Uh, yeah, I'm Charlie Beckett. I run POLIS at the London School of Economics. I just wanted to take up the Perugia declaration thing and offer Mark the support of LSE. And I think also we could get Emily Bell from Columbia and a bunch of other people. If there is a demand out there, you know, among, in the industry and elsewhere, then I think we ought to try and get it together. And uh, so I'd like to offer to help. Thank you very much. Um, just to, to wrap up on that question of switching off the PC, going and cleaning the gutters, do you ever do you find yourself increasingly wanting to do that? I do all the time. I mean, you know, one thing that's funny is that um, the day of the explosions in Boston, I, I may have tweeted once that day. You know, I mean, this is the, and this is not a good example quite of what you're talking about, but it's very important for us not to be so obsessed with um, with, with our, you know, connections to these social networks and an output standpoint that we aren't doing our jobs. But yeah, I mean, honestly, I, I've, got a, I've got an 11-month-old 11 month, 11 month old myself, so when I'm not working, I sometimes forget where, where I work for stretches of time. And I think there's incredible value of that, and I think you come back a, a better journalist, too. Yeah, I, uh, what I try to do is, I don't completely, I'm not off the grid completely when a big story like that is happening, but I do, I have, over time, decided to slow down the uh, number of updates that I put out and do a little bit more back check, check what I'm seeing, listen more, and only put things out when I feel comfortable enough with all the sourcing and the verification that I've done. And like I, I said earlier, I'm doing less updates through social media and I'm going back to uh, our website and doing things like live blogging, or uh, we call it live coverage that for whatever reason people don't like the term live blogging. We do live coverage on our site and we take our time and we pull in um, more context around the things that we're seeing. So we'll see things on social media, we'll absorb it, we'll call our sources, we'll, we'll do all the verification, and then we'll give you a little bit more context and uh, a, a more, uh, a, a, a better and, and more thoughtful version of what you're seeing on social media with, with the resources that we have. We're out of time. Um, you have been privileged to witness the birth of the Perugia Declaration, <laughs> soon to be the most important document in the history of social journalism. Um, it's not very often I get the chance to quote Charles de Gaulle at journalism conferences, but uh, he said, nothing more enhances authority than silence. And if there's one thing maybe we've learned from the discussion today and from the coverage of the Boston bombings is that amid the deafening noise, sometimes it's better to just keep your mouth shut sometimes. Uh, so please thank, thank you for your uh, contributions and please join me in thanking our panel.